Welcome to um, this presentation covering the topic of terminating individual employees. As we've covered in many of our uh, modules, we've, we've covered specific statutes, what that statute provides for in terms of employee protection and what it requires of employers. <clears throat> um, in this section of the course, we're looking at this area of the law in a different way. Instead of focusing on individual statutes, we try to consider the life cycle of the employee, key moments in his or her tenure with uh, the company, and uh, consider <clears throat> the various laws that might affect that relationship. So this is a not individual statute focused, but um, I guess you could say event focused. So let's get started. As um, we talked about before <clears throat> in other presentations, um, virtually all of our employment law statutes can apply to virtually all, I'll say virtually all, but a, a large portion of the life cycle events in an employee's time with the company. Um, so in some sense, each one of these topics, I could just kind of regurgitate all of the things that we've covered about Title VII, about the National Labor Relations Act, about ERISA, about Age Discrimination Employment Act, about Americans with Disabilities Act, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to assume that you're already familiar with the um, specifics of each one of those statutes. And so we're just gonna kind of look at it the way that an HR professional or an attorney or paralegal will look at this area, because usually we don't, we're not confronted with a, well, how does Title VII work kind of question. Instead, we have a circumstance that's come up. Well, we need to do a layoff, or uh, Bob's been tardy too often, what do we do? It's a very practical solution, and so nobody's coming to us and saying, well, tell me about Title VII. They're saying, we need to address this issue, what are our options? And so it requires kind of this holistic approach to all the statutes. You have to think through, well, does this, would this statute apply? Would this statute limit the ability of the employer to respond in a particular way? As a result, in this particular module, I'm not gonna do a deep dive into any of the statutes. Primarily what I'm gonna do is flag it and say, hey, this statute can apply here. So think about it, and if you need to go back and review the specifics, go ahead and do that. But I'm not gonna try to repeat the material that I've already covered in other modules. Hopefully that makes sense. So we're gonna begin by discussing the topic of constructive discharge. And really the question here is, do we even have a dismissal under these circumstances, or is this a resignation? Um, reasonable minds can sometimes differ, and I'm gonna kind of take apart the various uh, situations and, and permutations that kind of are in play when we're talking about the possibility <clears throat> of a constructive discharge claim. Then we'll talk about employment at will and briefly cover some of the exceptions to that doctrine. We'll discuss some of the unlawful reasons that uh, can arise in a termination situation. Then we will briefly talk about the just will, excuse me, just cause a due process type approach to employment. And finally, we'll talk about if we've decided we're going to dismiss somebody, how should we go about conducting the dismissal? So let's get started. Again, our first question is, is there even a dismissal? Well, um, many, um, many people in the HR biz will uh, refer to termination as the death penalty in employment law. Um, I think that it's used in that way for a couple of reasons. Number one, it severs the relationship. The employee-employer relationship is quote unquote dead at that time. Uh, but I think usually what people are focusing on more than that aspect is that it is the most extreme sanction that an employer can, can take. Um, I suppose there are certain times where employers may decide to have an employee arrested, so you could say that's that's more serious. But um, in the vast, vast majority of cases, we're really thinking about the most severe sanction that is available. And it's one that juries take very seriously. Juries are um, inclined to see themselves more as employees than managers. For one thing, most of the people on a jury panel are go well, all of them virtually will have been an employee or at least married to an employee. 
And even if they have also been a manager, they've been managed themselves. And so their first inclination is to kind of be on the side of the little guy, so to speak. And so they're going to take, take apart the decisions made, the actions taken, uh, the reasons, the justifications, the uh, modus operandi, uh, and reach a conclusion about whether it's okay or not. Now you might say, but, but that's not the standard that juries are supposed to apply. Juries are supposed to apply the law, and you've told us in the past that this is an at-will uh, country, and so if the employees might say, well, we disagree with the decision, we think it was unfair, excuse me, the, the jury might say, we disagree with the decision, we think it was unfair and unjust, but we can't find a law that was violated, so we're going to find in favor of the employer. I mean, that's what employers would like juries to do, and certainly that has happened. Um, but I would say that there's also a strong current amongst jurors that ask the question, well, does this smell okay to us? Does this feel okay? Um, it's almost as if uh, they're being asked to sign off on the decision that the employer made. If the jury looks at the decision and concludes, eh, this wasn't right, maybe no laws were violated, but this just doesn't feel right, it's likely that the employee, that the, uh, the jury will side with the employee. Um, and so even though the law may not be consistent with that, uh, there's an idea called jury nullification, and, and under this doctrine, the, the, the jury is essentially throws out the law and says, what should we do? What's the right solution to this issue? And so um, even when the law is on the side of the employer, it doesn't always mean that the employer is going to be successful. And so that's one of the reasons when we're dealing with terminations that employers have to be so careful. Employers have to comply with the law, but they also are wise if they also consider, does this feel right? Would somebody on the outside look at our, the decisions that we're making and say, yep, got to do it. It's hard. It's difficult. Um, I feel for the employee, but yeah, I'm okay with you doing that. That's the time that the, empl the employer is going to be relatively safe about going ahead and doing the dismissal. As you probably gathered, the, the time that the vast majority of employment-related lawsuits arise is when somebody has been dismissed. There will occasionally be failure to hire cases or failure to promote or uh, demote cases, but there's not a lot of activity in the area. For one thing, if you were not hired, you usually aren't in a very good position to evaluate why you weren't hired. I mean, you don't know who else they were considering in most cases. And so it could be that somebody who was absolutely amazing was the next candidate. Another reason I think that people don't do failure to hire cases is they're just not that invested in them. I mean, if someone is looking for a job, he or she's probably putting out dozens of resumes. And uh, under those circumstances, to get too worked up about one particular interview seems a little bit uh, maybe disproportionate. So failure to hire cases are fairly unusual. Failure to promote or uh, situations where there's a dem demotion involved, um, those are less likely to result in litigation, I think, for two reasons. First of all, the dollars and cents don't necessarily add up to a, a claim that an attorney is going to be interested in taking because, um, you know, failure to promote, yes, okay, you can sue for the difference between what that employee is earning now and what he or she would have earned if he or she had gotten the promotion, but that's just not going to be a ton of money. And in a demotion situation, there may be a, a, a reduction in pay, but it's not going to be huge. So the dollars and cents make those cases hard. But the, probably the bigger reason, or at least maybe equally good reason, is that if the employee is still there working, the employee is going to be very uncomfortable with the idea of suing his, his manager. That's a very difficult position to be in in most cases. And so that's a, a situation that most employees would just as soon avoid. So we don't see a lot of situations in which involve an employee still remaining with the organization 
at the time that he or she is suing. You do see some harassment claims, typically sexual harassment claims, and they can go on while the employee is still employed. Um, those, though, aren't that common um, in situations where the employee is still there. Oftentimes the employee will be fired, perhaps for an unrelated reason, or maybe it's a phony reason that's being given, or perhaps the employee quit out of frustration. Um, that's probably the more common path to a sexual harassment lawsuit. Um, so those are some uh, scenarios that, that can play out in this area of the law. Another time that you see employment discrimination cases is what I call a, um, a, a, a best, a, the best defense is a good offense type approach. And this oftentimes happens in the, um, well, related to a retaliation type claim. So imagine that I recognize that I'm not going to be long with this company. Uh, this company is signaling to me they're going to get rid of me. Maybe they've got a good reason. Maybe they don't have a good reason. But I've gotten some, I'm, I'm, I've taken some steps down the progressive disciplinary approach. And I just don't think I'm going to be <laughs> permitted to stay here much longer. But it's not imminent. It's not going to be tomorrow, for example. Well, one thing that employees sometimes do is file a charge at this point. Um, they may char file the charge because they legitimately feel that they are being discriminated against or retaliated against. And after all, they are being uh, uh, treated in a negative way because they're being you know, told that their lights are unacceptable or their productivity is unacceptable or whatever particular thing is not unacceptable about their performance. And certainly, it could be that the, what the employer is really finding unacceptable is this person's race or this person's religion or this person's gender or some other aspect about this person other than a legitimate concern about job performance. So sometimes the employee files a charge because he or she genuinely believes that he or she is being subject to discrimination. Sometimes, and I think it varies, uh, you know, I don't know if anyone knows exactly what percentage of times it is, but sometimes, though, the employee is doing this in the, uh, the best defense is a good offense type idea. Oh, he sees the handwriting on the wall. I'm going to be fired. But you know what? If I have a charge pending, they're going to be too chicken to fire me because that's going to sm uh, smack of retaliation. Oh, Bob files a charge on October 1st, and he's fired on November 1st. Hmm, do the math. Yep, that must be retaliation. The employer is going to be too chicken to go ahead and pull the trigger. And if the employer does go ahead and pull the trigger, well, my lawsuit is significantly better than it was previously. And after all, what do I have to lose? Things are already super tense at work can't really get more tense and in fact they might well back off when I file this charge so things might actually get better and even if things do get worse well I mean I can always quit it they're about to fire me anyway so really there's not a lot of of downside to filing that charge even if maybe the facts aren't as awesome as the employee would ideally like them to be to be successful in the claim but it does change the facts on the ground and the employer has to think long and hard about whether it wants to go ahead and fire somebody who has a pending charge because that looks very much like retaliation. We'll talk more about retaliation in a little bit. So in this presentation we're going to focus probably about 75 percent of it on the private sector employee who works in a non-unionized facility. Uh, this, there's just so much to cover in this course to, to spend a lot of time on unionized facilities in Texas where there just aren't a ton of them or public sector employee circumstances. We just don't have the luxury of that much time and so um, I'm not going to do a deep dive into those topics but I will touch on a few of them that are relevant to both union situations and to a public sector employment. Of course, when we're talking about private sector non-unionized employees, we're really probably focusing on the term employment at will. We'll talk about this in more detail. It's a term that we've seen 
pop up again and again. Um, I think that this is, again, one of those big terms that's a surprise for many employees um, who um, are, or many workers who are um, in this area uh, of the law. They think that because they have been, uh, that they're an employee, that they have a right to be treated in a way that they think is fair that if they aren't treated fairly, that somehow or another that raises a legal claim. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that idea has come from. Um, I think part of it is that all the laws about discrimination has caused people to think, well, it's wrong to discriminate against somebody. So, you know, other things that are, are wrong or, or immoral probably are illegal too. Perhaps some people get confused because of the differences between a unionized setting and a non-unionized setting. So they may have gotten the idea because of family or friends who work in a unionized setting that there's some kind of just cause standard. Or perhaps they have a family member or they themselves work for the, for the government. And so many times a just cause or due process standard does apply. But for whatever reason, this belief is very, very deeply ingrained in many, many workers. And <clears throat> that oftentimes is what causes them to file a lawsuit. Let me give you an example of this. Um, this is by no means an extraordinary example. It's actually a fairly common circumstance. Um, an employee uh, of a facility uh, worked, he, he was a shift worker. He worked an evening shift. And in this particular facility, they had a cafeteria, but the cafeteria wasn't, you know, working in the evening. And so what the workers would oftentimes do during their break or their meal period is they would go to where the vending machines were and, you know, get some chips or get a Coke or something like that. Anyway, one particular day, the um, vending machine, uh, you know, the, the, somebody put in money into the vending machine and um, the product didn't come out. And uh, they tried, you know, to hit the button to get the money to retur be returned and no money came out. And so um, ordinarily, I suppose, uh, typically the employees would have gone to uh, the front office and said, hey, we want, we want a refund. We put in money and it didn't um, take it, to, it didn't give us anything in return. But because these individuals worked an off shift, there really weren't a lot of other people in the facility. And so there wasn't anybody who could refund the money. Now, I suppose one of these workers could come during the day and get a refund. But I mean, it's not a ton of money. So it seems like kind of a big hassle. But you can see how the employees could be a little bit frustrated by this. Uh, the machine ate their money and what are the, and they want a snack, you know, they have a lot of hours to work and you know, they're hungry. And so um, as a result, the employees kind of got a little frustrated. One of the employees um, decided, well, what we need to do is just shake the machine a bit and that will loosen the food product and it'll fall into the tray and then we'll be able to get it. So he went over and shook the machine a little bit and he shook it a little bit more. I can't remember if he was successful or not, um, but in any event, he, he shook the machine. In this particular area, I guess because there are these, you know, these, these machines present, and maybe because it's the cafeteria, I'm not quite sure why, there had been cameras trained on this area. And um, when someone was reviewing the tape later on, they saw this incident where this, this man, this employee was shaking one of the machines. Now, the man did not steal anything from the machine, and he did not damage the machine. No one was injured in this situation. But these are very big machines, and if you shake it, you can cause it to fall over, and people can be crushed or very, very badly injured. It certainly could be a fatal situation. So the employer decided to fire this, this man, none of the other workers, just this man, and he filed a claim saying that this was wrongful dismissal. He filed it in JP court. And I was charged with the task of defending the employer. And I basically told him, hey, I told the, the justice of the peace, this is at will employment. This is what the law is in the state of Texas. Um, it doesn't matter whether what we did was fair or right or reasonable. All that matters is that you know, you, you, you were employed at will and 
we get to fire you whenever we want to. The man was not alleging that he was discriminated against because of his gender or his age or his race or anything like that. He just said it wasn't fair. The JP in that case said, yep, the law is clear. You aren't entitled to any remedy. Maybe I don't agree with what the employer did, but um, it doesn't matter whether I agree. That's the way the law works. I will tell you that gentleman was astonished when he heard this. He was deeply, deeply persuaded that he had been mistreated. After all, he was trying to help a friend get the money back. He wasn't trying to steal anything. He wasn't trying to damage property. He didn't steal anything. He didn't damage property. I'll be honest with you. When I heard his case, I thought to myself, gosh, why couldn't the employer have just given him a stern warning? Um, you know, I was actually fairly sympathetic for the gentleman. Um, but again, that's not, that's not how I'm, at will employment works. The employer gets to make these decisions. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we're talking about the topic of constructive discharge, and let's pause for a second and talk about what we mean when we use this term. I think we all know what we mean when we say discharge. That's when we fire somebody or we... Um, terminate somebody or we um, involuntarily separate them from employment. The word constructive in the law means kind of, sort of, but not quite. It, it, uh, in this context, it means you, you did it in a different way and even though it doesn't in some sense look like a discharge, the effect of it was a discharge. So let's go back to my story about the man. We'll call him Bob. Bob, the, the vending machine shaker. And let's say Bob had, had a job. He was earning $15 an hour, and his job was to um, uh, uh, answer calls. Um, uh, maybe this was, was, was a service that was uh, troubleshooting computer problems or something. He was knowledgeable about computers. He enjoyed dealing with them. Uh, he uh, had a feeling of satisfaction when he was able to solve an employee, uh, customer's problems. That was his job. So he shakes the machine. The employer, instead of dismissing him, decides, you know what? We're not sure this employment at will thing is going to hold up. So we, we're, we just want him to resign. We want to put him in a position that he doesn't want to be here anymore. I mean, Bob's got skills. He can go get another job. And so all we have to do is put the pressure on him and he'll eventually buckle and say, you know what? I've had enough of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop Bob's pay down the minimum wage and we're going to tell him, Bob, your, your job now is cleaning bathrooms. You can clean toilets all uh, for your eight hours a night. Um, you're, you know, and, and Bob's like, but I don't want to do that. Well, that's the job we have for you, Bob. Are you quitting? Uh, well, but I want to do my computer job that I was hired for. Well, we don't have that job for you anymore. The job we have for you now is cleaning bathrooms. But I don't want that job. Ah, so you are resigning. Okay, well, best of luck to you, Bob. We're sorry to see you go. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't be a stranger, but don't ever come back, of course. Um, that's what a constructive discharge looks like. When the employer doesn't want to actually say the words, you're fired, but wants to cause the employee to go ahead and leave the place of employment. So here's our definition. A constructive discharge is a termination when the employer creates intolerable working conditions with the intention of forcing the employee to quit and a reasonable person would have felt compelled to quit. Uh, this is an objective standard. So we're not thinking about Bob particularly and considering all of his uh, uh, specific personality traits to see whether Bob, that particular human being, would have felt compelled to fire, but whether a reasonable person under those circumstances. Uh, let me change up the facts a little bit. So after Bob uh, shakes the machine, his boss comes to him and says, hey, Bob, you know, uh, we have, uh, we want to change your, your working conditions a little bit. We're going to move your desk. You're, you're over in uh, cubicle four, which you share with three other workers. And we're going to move you over to cubicle five, which you'll share with three other new workers. Um, now, Bob's best friends are in his current cubicle. I mean, they really, really have gelled together. I mean, he goes drinking with them. He has just the best time with them. 
the three people in the cubicle that he's going to be um, working in now um, are people he just doesn't care for. He doesn't have anything in common with them. Uh, they annoy him. He doesn't want to spend eight hours a day with those people. I mean, he doesn't, you know, they don't tell dirty jokes. They don't, you know, they don't have any particular mean streak or anything violation of any procedure, but he just really disliked them. One has a really annoying voice. Another person likes to hum to herself a lot. And the third person, um, he uh, eats chips at his desk sometimes, and that sound is just nails on a chalkboard to Bob. Anyway, um, so Bob says, I'm going to have to quit. I just cannot stand to work with those three people. But it would be hard for Bob to successfully argue that moving from one cubicle to another when your job duties aren't changing, when the number of workers in the cubicle isn't changing, when your hours aren't changing, when your pay rate isn't changing, that hardly is an intolerable working condition uh, situation. Um, and a reasonable person would not have been might, would not have been would not have felt that he was compelled to quit under the circumstances. Now Bob might be sincere when he says, "Listen, there was no way I could face forty hours a week of those three people. Um, I really, really did feel I had to quit." Bob's not lying when he says that, but he is not the typical ordinary person. Maybe the ordinary person would find these three people more palatable than the three people Bob currently offices with. But the important thing is that it's an objective standard. We're not considering Bob's individual quirks. We're thinking about kind of what's an average person's reaction to the situation. And the, the intolerable conditions have to be pretty intolerable. They have to be a pretty stark change. You have to look at it, basically, and you have to think to yourself, if you were looking at these facts, that the employer really was just setting Bob up. Just didn't want to pull the trigger on Bob, wanted Bob to be the one to walk out. But it was clearly the goal that they wanted to get Bob, get rid of Bob. So that's a constructive discharge claim. But let's pause here and talk about constructive discharge because sometimes people have a misunderstanding about this. There is nothing wrong with engaging constructive discharge if it would have been perfectly lawful for the employer to actually discharge the person. So let's go back to our example. Bob shook the machine. As we've already figured out, the employer had the legal right to fire Bob for doing that. So definitely the employer could have engaged in constructive discharge and you know, demoted Bob to janitor and reduced his pay significantly um, because if, Bob, if the employer could legally discharge Bob, it could also legally constructively discharge Bob. So a constructive discharge claim is not any stronger or weaker than what the claim would have been if the employer had actually discharged uh, the particular employee. So that is our first topic. Our, we need to figure out is constructive discharge an issue or was it a true case of resignation? Let's dive in more detail into the topic of employment at will. This is the law that has existed in um, common law jurisdictions for you know as long as time, pretty much. It was really the only legal standard that existed into, uh, up until the, the time of the, the Great Depression when we started seeing some labor laws and then of course in the 60s we saw employment discrimination laws uh, develop. But prior to that time, an employer could end an employment relationship whenever he or she wanted to unless there was an employment contract in play and those were quite unusual. So the standard or the definition that we have for employment at will is an employer may terminate an employee for any reason except for unlawful reasons. And of course, the employee has the same right. The employee can walk away from an employment relationship at any time with or without notice. And so it's a, it, the, the um, concept behind this is that it's an equal relationship. They are both parties to a contract. They both entered in the contract and they both can exit whenever they want to. Um, it has the appearance of equality between the parties. Now many would say, well, in most cases, the employer has more economic uh, clout, has more ability to easily find a replacement than the employee does. Um, and so some people say that, that the, 
appearance of parity between the employee and the employer is misleading. But whether it's misleading or not, that is the law in Texas. That's in the law really in, in all, uh, well, 49 out of 50 states, and I would argue even the 50th state, that's pretty much the law. And so whether it's a good law or bad law is something that people can, can uh, reasonably differ on, but it is definitely the standard that we have. But there are some times where we see that, that uh, another standard exists. And, and this other standard is usually referred to as a just cause or a due process standard. About 20% of the workforce are going to fall under that, which of course means 80% are in the employment at will circumstance. So who participates in a just cause circumstance? Well, almost all unionized workers participate in a just cause situation. Also, most government employees uh, have a just cause situation with their employment. Uh, there can also be situations where an employee has a, um, a, a contract of employment, say like a sports, uh, sports athlete or a, uh, an actor or an actress in, in a movie or something along those lines. Those individuals will typically have a clause in their contract which provides for just cause in the, in the, in the situation of termination. So the standard is going for the just cause situation is going to be that the employers bear the burden of proving that the termination was proper and based upon good and unlawful and lawful reasons. So um, here, the, the, instead of it being employer can discharge for any reason except for unlawful reasons, as we have with employment at will, and the just cause situation is kind of turned on its head. Um, most, uh, you know, it, it's not that, hey, here's employers can go ahead and dismiss except for these couple of carved out situations. But the vast majority of the reasons out there, the employer can still go ahead and dismiss, even if they're mean or silly reasons. Well, in a just cause situation, there's only a few legal reasons you can dismiss somebody. Most of the reasons are going to fall outside of that area. So it's, it's kind of an inverted example from that perspective that then the employer has to prove that you're in one of these spots where it's okay to dismiss. Whereas over here, it's going to be on the employee to prove that there is some law that was violated with respect to the employment circumstance. So this really is a dramatically different standard. And you need to know if you're the HR professional, you need to know which is the standard for your particular employment population because it's going to dramatically change how you approach dismissal decisions in that environment. Okay, so let's go on and talk about some of these exceptions. So we've said there are exceptions, but let's talk about what those exceptions might look like. Okay, so um, um, legal protections for wrongful discharge can arise from a, a constitution. This can be US or state, from a, a statute. This can be a US statute a state statute, or even a local statute. And then they can arise from the common law. And there's really, of course, the common law is a huge, huge, massive amount of law. Um, but most common law cases are, that involve employment discrimination are gonna be a contract theory or a tort theory. So let's go forward and explore these issues in more detail. So here's a breakdown of a lot of the major cases that we've looked at. So in the constitutional area, this stuff is mainly going to be restricted to government workers. If you don't fall into that category, you're probably not gonna have a lot of luck with these um, categories. There is in California uh, some state constitutional provisions that do apply to private employers, but they wouldn't have, that, that would not work in Texas. Then of course we have all the statutory protections. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, Age Discrimination Employment Act, Title VII, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We have the National Labor Relations Act, the Family and Medical Leave Act. We have the Occupational Safety and Health Act. We have the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. We have uh, whistleblower protection statutes. We have USERA, the Uniform Services Employment Restoration Rights Act. Hard to remember that one. And we have um, 
in some jurisdictions off-duty conduct laws and we do have this in Montana a statute that has overturned the um, uh, at will at will employment situation these are just examples of statutes but they hit the, the the rock stars of this particular area and these are going to typically apply in the union context as well as the private sector employment situation of course this one just applies in the union context or most of its provisions just apply in the union context they, these protections will apply in the public sector and the private sector then of course over here we have common law these will apply both in the a government and the private sector and um, under the contract thing of course we have labor agreements which would be a unionized situation then we can have express employee contracts in other words these are contracts that the parties actually have negotiated over this would be you know when um, you know the football star comes in and um, uh, you know he's he's a uh, going to be on the 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 the, the a quarterback for the new professional football team well he's going to negotiate a contract and the contract is going to have language about you know when and how and if he can be his employment can end um these other three ideas are contra I, I like to think of them as kind of contract light these are situations that can arise when a person is neither in a union situation nor does he have an express contract. But there's something kind of contract-y or contract-ish about the uh, arrangement. These theories um, have a varying degree of purchase in, um, you know, really varies from state to state. In California, these theories will take you pretty far and so of course once one of these theories kicks in then at will employment is pretty much not even an issue so this is going to replace so these ideas replace at will employment um, in texas these ideas have not really taken off um, very far and so I would say uh, I guess this can change over time but I would say that these are not major concerns that Texas employers have let's consider the tort situation we have the public policy exception we'll talk more about how this works in Texas with Sabine pilot in a couple of minutes we have intentional interference with a contractual relationship um, this is a tort that does is acknowledged in Texas it has some teeth um, we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes then these are some other torts we're really actually not going to talk about these today because we've talked about these in another section but we have the intentional infliction of emotional distress we have defamation we have the, the four privacy torts we have false imprisonment these are um, other ways to get at wrongful dismissal these are more about how it was done or what happened after the fact versus actually making the particular decision to dismiss so this is a good cheat sheet um, you may even want to uh, flag this one slide 12 and and look at this and kind of re review in your own mind do i know what the requirements are what the elements are for each one of these particular statutes don't worry about knowing this one um, but but the others and don't worry for the most part about knowing these but the others are, are important things for you to be familiar with so let's talk about a breach of implied contract again this isn't likely to work in Texas but you may well have uh, you know employees uh, depending upon the business that you work with that are located in different states so again uh, when you have a contract the employment at will doctrine goes poof because that is just a place set placeholder when there isn't any type of contract that's explicit between the parties that's expressed between the parties so you have in one area you have the express contract and then the other then if you think about the whole universe so we have here's all the employees out there and almost everyone is at will then you have the few that have employment contracts i'm just going to put a k here for contracts these are the pretty much the two positions that we have in texas but there are some jurisdictions which have this kind of uh, amorphous kind of additional thing and this is 
an implied contract category. And let's consider what an implied contract could look like. This is when an employer makes promises to his or her employees. And um, the employee oftentimes will change his or her position based upon these promises. And then the employer doesn't fulfill those promises. And now the employee has lost the advantage or the benefit of that promise. And because he or she trusted the employer, he or she might be in a worse position. Imagine for a second that um, I've been working for Bob for about five years. I earn about $40,000 a year. I'm a really good worker. Bob really does rely upon me greatly. I've come to him several times and said, hey, you know, I feel like I should be getting a raise. Bob says we just can't afford it. So six months goes by and I decide, you know what, I just need more money. So I, so I go out there and I find another job and I get a job for $55,000 more responsibility, private office, very awesome opportunity. Um, I go in to see Bob. I say, hey, Bob, got to turn in my letter of resignation. Sorry to do it, but I got a job, Rob, earning $55,000 a year. Can't pass on that. Bob says, well, gosh, Griver, I mean, we really want to keep you. How about this? I'll tell you what. That place, it does layoffs pretty regularly. You know that. You hear people talk about that. Well, you're right, Bob, but still, I just need the money, and I'm a good worker. I think I can survive layoffs. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't, but I'll tell you what. You stay here. I'll raise your pay to $52,000, and I'm going to guarantee you life employment. You never have to worry about uh, being in the unemployment line if you stay here. I can't pay you quite as much, but I can give you job security. I go back to my office, talk to my spouse. Okay, Bob. I, I very much value job security. I'd like to earn the 55, but well, I, I can stick around for the 52. So I go ahead and stay with the 52. Two months later, Bob uh, dismisses me. Uh, times are tough, just don't have enough work for everybody. And now that I'm paying you $52,000, you know, that's just more than I can afford. And so uh, sorry to say it, but you have to go. But Bob, you told me I had employment for life. Well, I changed my mind. Well, but that job that I had with the other employer, I mean, it's already been filled. I can't get that job. Too bad for you. Well, but I mean, I don't know where, where I can get another job. Well, that's your problem, not mine. You can see in that situation that Bob lied to me about extending to me that, uh, you know, he wasn't really intending to give me that lifetime employment. And because I trusted him, um, I forwent our, our, uh, the, the opportunity to go with a new employer, and now that opportunity is not available to me. That would be the type of situation that a court would be inclined to give um, an implied contract type of, of claim um, that has kind of the markings of it. I will tell you that it would be a very difficult thing to persuade a Texas judge to recognize that type of implied contract theory though. You'd really need to have pretty egregious facts along the lines that I've talked about, perhaps even more egregious than these. So what are we looking at when we're looking at implied contract? Well, there has to have been a specific promise that was made. The person making it had to appear to have the authority to make it and the employee had to know about the, the promise. Um, another way that's perhaps even more common or maybe more common, maybe it's not more common, but it certainly comes up is when you have some kind of communication to employees. Maybe it's on the company website. Maybe it's an employee manual of some type. Anyway, in that, uh, sometimes employers, in the interest of full disclosure or perhaps motivating the best type of behavior, will oftentimes give very detailed explanations about how they'll proceed in a disciplinary sense. You, know, you can have this many lates, and then this will happen, then you're going to have, if you have another late, then this happens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you do this, then this will happen. And they really, and the idea here is it's not a bad one, really, but the employer is saying, listen, I we just want to be above board. We want to tell the employees exactly what we're going to do. So nobody's surprised. I mean, isn't that a good thing? Well, Yes, but 
maybe not too. Let me explain to you the problems that can come up with that type of approach. One problem is that when you lock yourself into a particular disciplinary path, it makes it difficult to uh, act flexibly. Now, it is important to be consistent with workers, and so there is there is definitely a benefit to having a policy that's clearly stated, and so uh, if you, it, it, can, it can motivate managers to be very consistent with the policy simply because it's out there. But there are times when you're going to want to vary the policy. For example, if you have a very long-term uh, employee, and you have a very short-term employee, and they do the same thing, you might very reasonably want to fire the short-termer and keep the long-term person. Uh, uh, maybe the long-term person's one action was an out-of-character deviation from policy. The short-termer, you don't know if it's a deviation or not. You don't have enough experience with him or her to know whether this was a, a weird once-in-a-lifetime thing or whether it's something that's going to be recurring. You're just not that sufficiently invested in that person. But the long-time person, you do have a lot invested. Also, probably the long-term employee is going to be in a much better position to file some type of lawsuit against. If he's a long-term employee, he's probably over 40, right? Um, and, and juries are going to, going to feel on some level that a long-term employee is kind of entitled to more due process than a short-term employee. I mean, there's no statute that provides that, but that's just a sense that the, the, the jury is likely to have. So when you provide this detail listing that is very formulaic and then you decide to vary from that, well, the whole document becomes compromised. And so any of these exceptions can be used against the employer to show, oh, wait a second, you know, maybe there's 15 terminatable offenses. And one of those offenses was um, taking office supplies home for personal use. Um, and uh, you decided not to fire Bob because he'd been with the company 30 years and he just took home a stapler. I mean, it hardly was a big deal thing. And he even told you he was planning on bringing it back the next day. He just wanted to staple some stuff at home. Um, but the rules say automatic termination and you didn't fire Bob. So then when you fire Larry for uh, violating the attendance policy, Larry can use Bob as a comparator, even though Bob was never tardy a day in his life. But because it's all one policy, all found in the same document, uh, one inconsistency can, then Larry can say, well, why didn't you make an exception for me? You made an exception for Bob. What Bob did was supposed to result in dismissal, and yet you didn't dismiss Bob. What I did was supposed to lead to dismissal, and you went ahead and dismissed me. Why didn't you treat me the way you treated Bob? Maybe it's because I'm of a different religion or a different race or a different gender than Bob. Maybe that's what's really going on here. So that can be a reason uh, not to be extremely detailed about how you're going to go ahead handle these situations because you want to have some level of flexibility. And as long as you're statutorily required to be flexible, for example, um, let's say what Bob did was related in some respects to his disability. Um, maybe uh, he uh, uh, needs a little bit more time uh, to, for his breaks because he um, has medical issues. He's in a wheelchair and it takes him extra time to get to the wheelchair uh, capable bathroom and just the process of, of attending to those biological needs are more complicated since he's in a wheelchair. And so most people just have the 15 minute break. You know what? It takes Bob 20 minutes to get down there, take care of what he needs to and get back. And um, or most employees, if they're not back in 15 minutes, they get written up, but Bob doesn't. Um, and so you might say, well, that's an, an example of a difference in policy. And if you had it documented in the personnel manual, if you're late, if you take more than 15 minutes, you're going to be written up and Bob isn't, you could say, well, that's an inconsistency. But probably giving Bob the extra five minutes is a reasonable accommodation for his disability. So sometimes those detailed list of, of the rules can actually interfere with your legal compliance approach. Um, 
so that's one reason why an exhaustive listing now you can you can list the things that can result in dismissal but saying that they will you know without any levels of discretion or or other approaches is is a dangerous path to take um, it's good to say these may result in dismissal um, over time you may decide that you need to be more strong on a particular issue maybe uh, you have had some people who um, didn't used to abuse this policy and now that seems to be a very common area where people are abusing the policy so you've decided you know instead of giving four warnings we're going to bring it down to two warnings or something like that well if you've already had it out there that you are um, the, the, this is the, the process and now you're going to change it to a, a more more strict process you have to be sure that you're communicating it well to employees um, how are you communicating how will they know how will you prove that they knew that the policy has changed another issue is a disclaimer if you were to go to most employee handbooks online or on paper form there will be a section that says something like you know we're an at-will employer uh, nothing in this uh, policy manual should be interpreted to uh, uh, change that fact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's usually a definition of at-will employee in that, in that sense. You want to make sure that whatever that disclaimer is, is going to work in your particular state. In some jurisdictions, the font needs to be of a certain size. Um, it's a, oftentimes a good policy to put it in bold so it's very easily seen and also to put it in a prominent location. You want to think through that language very closely. Um, you probably want to have this type of disclaimer even if you don't go through an exhaustive listing like this, but the more granular you get on how you can be dismissed, the more essential it is that you have a disclaimer. And it's probably a good idea that you have these two very, very close to each other, or at least some kind of reference to this policy near this and maybe you know a link so that the, the individual employee can go to that policy um, so here's here's a definition of disclaimers disclaimers are written statements in employee document employment documents that deny these statements create any contractual rights binding on the employer and again you want to do this to maintain that at will employment status um, disclaimers should be communicated to employees and employees should acknowledge receipt of the disclaimer in writing. Uh, if you've ever worked for a place where you've received a paper copy of the employee handbook, there oftentimes is something you tear out or some kind of separate sheet that you will uh, need to sign and date to show that you've received the handbook. The major reason that the employer wants you to sign that is because of this disclaimer. I mean, the manual may be 50 pages long, Really, though, what they want is they want to document that you had in your hands this disclaimer. It might have been one paragraph somewhere in the middle of the document, but that's really what the acknowledgement is about. We're not really going to talk about the a breach of an implied covenant very much, I assume a, Im, implied contract very much, uh, because these are areas that aren't really going to work in Texas. But we see that, and this is true, that all contracts have an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing within them. Uh, contracts are usually not adversarial experiences. If I um, decide that I want to let's say you have a business and I, I have a business I make toasters and you make widgets and I want to enter into business with you where I purchase a certain number of your widgets every month and they are I use them inside my toaster um, I see you as my ally and you see me as your ally we are uh, not literally partners but we have a kind of a partnership spirit we're not adversarial I mean there will be sections of the contract that are kind of zero-sum games I mean the more that I pay for the widgets is the more money you make and the less money I make but generally speaking we both want the other to succeed it's, it's in both of our interests for the relationship to be successful in those types of contracts uh, certainly in that is the idea of a covenant of good faith and fair dealing we have that in Texas but for the most part that does not implicate at will employment at least as how it's understood in Texas you know at will employment is a type of contract it's just the type of contract that either party can decide at any time to end and so yes in theory the covenant of good faith and fair dealing is part of that at will employment contract 
but it really is unlikely to uh, generate any types of claims that the employee might have. A promissory estoppel is a situation in which an employer makes a promise and doesn't keep the promise and the employee is disadvantaged. Kind of like the example I started with where, you know, I was the good worker earning $40,000 a year and Bob offered me more money if I wouldn't take that other job. Um, and yet the Bob did not plan on fulfilling his promise, or at least he didn't fulfill his promise. A promissory estoppel is a difficult argument to make in Texas. It has been successful, but it's just not a way to, to, to count on, I guess, if you're the employee. Now, having said that, since we are the advocates for the employers, it certainly is a good idea to train your work, your managers not to make these types of promises. And it's a good idea sometimes to include one of those disclaimers on the annual appraisal. Something along the lines of, you know, all employees here are employed at will. If you feel like you have been extended some type of contract, um, you know, that's not the case. You should uh, raise that issue during this meeting or something like that. So that any sense that there is an employment contract can be dispelled at that time. That can be a smart place to get one of these disclaimers. Um, uh, resolved and you want to educate your managers not to make promises. Um, many times when managers do that they have good intentions. You have a good worker. You think he'll always be a good worker. You think you'll always be able to have a job for him. You want to reassure him. He want, Maybe he's about to buy a house or get married or start a family. He wants some assurances and you can understand why he wants assurances. And you want him to stay with your company. And so all of those things kind of roll up together and you start saying, of course we're going to have a job for you. Bob, you're valuable to this organization. When you start saying things like that, you possibly are going to get into this dangerous territory. So it's a good idea to train your managers to say things like, you know, what we see now, you're a good fit for us, and we certainly hope, and we have no reason to think that it will ever change. But, you know, I, I don't have the ability to enter into some kind of uh, understanding with you kind of beyond the employment relationship that you already um, have with us. Okay, so here's another a contract related claim that um, is uh, something that we actually do see come up sometimes in Texas. This is intentional interference with business relationship. We call it, the, we typically call it the intentional interference with a business relationship in Texas. This occurs when there's intentional improper interference um, causing a third party to breach its contract with the plaintiff or not to enter into a contractual relationship with the plaintiff. Um, let me give you an example. This is going to seem counterintuitive. Um, so this is a, a bit of a, this can be an opportunity to kind of get our heads around. So we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Um, so imagine that um, uh, I am employed at Bob's. I'm earning the $40,000 a year at Bob's and I get a call uh, from Larry, um, the owner of the competing business. And Larry says, hey, Groover, I, I understand. Uh, Bob's only paying you $40,000 a year. I'd be willing to pay you 55. Why don't you come on over? Let's talk about it. Well, gosh, Larry, that sounds great. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about it. Okay, well, come on over. So I come over and talk to, to Larry, and Larry offers me a job for 55000 I say, yep, I'm signing up, Larry. Then I quit my job with Bob. Can Bob say that Larry intentionally interfered with a business relationship? Well, Bob and I did have a contract. It was an at-will contract, which either one of us could end at any point in time. Um, but it was still a contract. And so there is an argument to be made. And certainly, certainly Larry did intend to interfere with the contract. I mean, he knew I was working for Bob. He called me at my office. The issue is going to be whether it was an improper motive or not. Um, if Larry is seeking to hire me simply because he thinks I would be, a, because of my skill set, I would be a good addition to his team, then that's not an improper motive. But if he is hiring me for the purpose of disrupting Bob's business, let's say Larry happens to know that 
um, I am the key engineer on this particular project and we're about to move to production and because of the nature of what we produce these these few weeks right before we get into production are really a crunch time where you really need your engineer um, there able to, to troubleshoot and problem solve or the the rollout could really really be awful and so Larry waits until just this very sensitive time to kind of come in and swoop me away. He doesn't really need my services. He was actually fully staffed in the engineering function. He isn't hiring me because he wants another good engineer. He's hiring me because he wants to sabotage Bob's business. That would be a situation in which intentional inference with a business relationship would be potentially an actionable claim in Texas. But Bob, of course, would be suing Larry about this, and Bob would have to, you know, make a, a good attempt to argue that that Larry knew about this and this was Larry's true motivation um, and so that that is a possibility um, and a way that this plays out probably more commonly is when one employer kind of raids the workforce of another so instead of it just being me who's hired away it's my whole department Larry comes in let's say this is a 40 person operation and he comes in and hires all six of us in this one department and plops us down in his business he doesn't really need us but he wanted to destroy Bob's business once Bob can't continue in his business without those six people maybe Bob goes bankrupt and now Larry is able to extend his market share to take over the part of the marketplace that uh, Bob used to have that would be an example of, of the tort of intentional interference with the business relationship. Another possibility is the blacklisting situation. We actually have a statute in Texas, as most stat states do, that prohibit an employer from participating in a blacklisting arrangement. Uh, one way that this happens or historically has happened is that um, employee employers in a particular industry are in some sense in competition let's say it's a retail industry um, if I am a sales clerk with Dillard's it means I'm not a sales clerk with Kohl's and if I'm a sales clerk with Kohl's it means I'm not a sales clerk with JCPenney um, usually aren't going to be able to work in multiple places so you can see you know it comes time to hire for Christmas uh, seasonal help oftentimes it's a scramble to get the best people and so there's definitely some natural competition amongst the various retailers um, so it's adversarial between the the employers in that sense but there's also some sense of gosh we're all kind of in the same boat and so imagine that um, Bob works for we'll say Dillard's and Bob's caught stealing one day of course Dillard is going to fire Bob probably press charges against Bob if the facts are, are clear enough but imagine that the Dillard's might say listen you know what I mean I don't really want to help JC Penney and Coles out but um, I know Bob is just going to turn around and apply at those places and it would be nice if you know I mean I, I would appreciate it if, if the shoe were on the other foot if I would if I could have heard that that Bob was a thief before I hired him I, that would have surely made my life a lot easier so um, Dillard's might you know kind of whisper in somebody's ear at JC Penney or Coles hey you know don't don't hire that Bob Smith he's he's a thief and uh, Dillard's might be doing this because he wants to do a favor to you know maybe some colleagues because he probably knows some people over at, at these other retailers because there's I'm sure a back and forth between these businesses but also the Dillard's manager might be thinking boy you know and, and I, I'm, I'm happy to tell uh, these other retailers about Bob in the hopes that I'll know about the people they're firing so I don't accidentally hire them Anyway, that kind of informal process often becomes a more formal process, or at least at times it has. So there's these lists, and if you're on the list, you are blacklisted. No retailer is going to hire you because your name is on the list. I mean, you might have gotten on the list for a good reason, such as theft, or maybe your former managers didn't like you. Or maybe your former manager was a bigot who didn't like people of your 
race or religion or ethnicity or gender or whatever. Um, and so it was completely arbitrary and unfair situation. Um, the idea of having employee blacklists is um, unlawful and hopefully doesn't happen routinely anymore. In Texas, we have only one exception to the public policy uh, rule. And here we have it um, on this slide. And we don't actually have it via statute. We have it via a Texas Supreme Court case. And that is Sabine Pilot versus Hawk. Um, this, uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is a, a relatively old case. And it's a very narrow exception to the Atwell Doctrine. An employee has a cause of action against an employer if the employee is terminated solely for refusing to perform an illegal act. So if there's two reasons why he's fired, one of them being his refusal to perform an illegal act, and then another reason which would be maybe mean but not unlawful, um, then this exception doesn't fit. If um, the act wasn't illegal, but just immoral or unsafe, that's not going to fit. So this is a very narrow um, exceptions to the at-will employ employment uh, rule. Of course, we do have a few statutes that have uh, public policy exceptions. Um, so there are some whistleblower statutes, but the only uh, uh, common law uh, exception is this one and you are responsible for knowing Sabine Pilot and you're responsible for being able to to uh, identify it um, as being a very narrow policy um, going forward. You aren't responsible for knowing a lot of these uh, detailed uh, whistleblower statutes. We're not going to spend time talking about these. Let's talk briefly though about the civic duty laws. Um, there are certain activities that uh, an employee cannot be dismissed for. One is um, uh, employee has to be provided time to vote. Now, nowadays, this isn't a big issue because you can uh, do early voting or absentee voting. But once upon a time, you pretty much had to come on election day and, and vote. And if you might have a long shift uh, and the polls are busy that day, you might not have enough time to leave your work during your lunch or leave your work before or after um, work in order to vote. And so you might not have had that opportunity. And in fact, maybe your employer didn't want you to vote. And so intentionally scheduled you in such a way that you wouldn't be able to vote. Um, well, uh, you, nowadays you have to be given that opportunity to vote and um, uh, an employer can't dismiss you if you choose to vote um, there, you know, or you, you're, you only have one time to vote, and so you exercise that right to vote during your work shift. But as I say, this really isn't an issue anymore because of all the early voting we have today. Uh, another one is that when you are called to be a juror in a case, um, you're called for jury duty. That's a, a civic duty that you have as a citizen, and you cannot be dismissed for that. Now, employers are not required to pay you as if you were at work, uh, the employer is simply required to let you have the time off and to reinstate you at the end of that um, jury, jury service. Um, it's a good idea, of course, to keep your employer informed as you are on jury duty. Um, and the name of our statute here is the Juror's Right to Reemployment Act. We talked about USERA in the, um, in the FMLA section. This gives very extensive rights to reinstatement when we have uh, returning service members who, who were called up to active duty while they were employee and now they have ended their active duty, they're returning back to civilian life. Because they were performing a civic duty during that time, there are very, very generous protections for individuals in this circumstance. Be sure to go back and look at, at the FMLA slash USERA module for more specifics about this statute. Of course, we also have all these anti-retaliation, non-interference type statutes. Almost all the laws we've talked about, Title VII, Age Discrimination Employment Act, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, the National Labor Relations Act, the Equal Pay Act, um, the Fair Labor, Fair Labor Standards Act, 
the National Labor Relations Act. I mean, all those statutes have anti-retaliation uh, portions to it. And you get protection if you happen to file a charge against your employer. You give testimony either on your own behalf or for another employee's behalf, or you take some other action intending to ensure that these laws are enforced and the rights that these laws guaranteed are protected. If because of you taking one of these actions, your employer uh, dismisses you or in some other way retaliates against you, then you're going to have a claim under that statute. And that's pretty much universally true in this area of the law. We don't have a lot of off-duty conduct laws. In fact, we don't have any in Texas. Um, other states do have them. Usually the states are not, uh, are, are northern and eastern states. Some also in the uh, the westernmost part of the country. About half of the states have these types of laws. They're generally geared at protecting employees' use of tobacco and alcohol and other kind of leisure time activities. Uh, Texas does not have any protections in this area. Now, of course, I'm not saying that it's a smart idea for employers to regulate what employees do outside of work. There's some arguments for some of that regulation. For example, the use of tobacco and other products like that can have very significant health implications for the worker. And especially if the employer is providing health insurance, it can certainly, there's certainly an argument to be made that those uh, anti-smoking policies could be um, a, a, course of action that could save the employer money. Um, but that's really a, a company culture question, kind of balancing the interests of the employer against the uh, interests of the employee and deciding where to come down. But what I'm saying is whether it's a good policy or bad policy, those policies are generally going to be lawful in Texas, at least right now. But they may not be in other states. So if you are managing a workforce that crosses state bounds, you need to be sure that you know what the requirements are. Um, particularly with respect to the tobacco protection, there are some traditionally rather conservative states who have protections in this area. Uh, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, states like that, primarily because tobacco is a, a significant industry in their states, and so it kind of makes sense that they would be more inclined to protect the rights of smokers to engage in those products. Here is a uh, kind of a, a discussion about how we prove the prima facie case standard in a discharge case. And you can, we'll see these, uh, th we saw this prima facie case many, many times before. Okay, so we, you first of all, have to prove that the person was a member of the protected class. For example, was this person a man or a woman? Was this person, what was this person's race? Was this person African American? Was this person Caucasian? Was this person Asian? Was this person Native American? Or perhaps this person was, was buyer or multiracial? Um, was this person a, um, what was this person's national origin? Uh, French, German, Japanese, uh, Hispanic, uh, you know, obviously there's so many of those. Um, everyone has one or more national origins. Uh, was this person over the age of 40? Was this person a returning service member? Um, those characteristics um, you would want to think about. And of course, in a disparate, uh, in a, excuse me, in a, a disparate treatment discriminatory case, you might well, let's, let's say you have an African-American woman over 40, you might well advance a claim of sex discrimination, race discrimination, and age discrimination under those circumstances. Um, you want to say that the employee was qualified. That's what we're getting at here. That the employee was terminated. And this can be a little bit broader than this. Um, this could be some kind of adverse action. It doesn't have to be termination, but in this, since we're covering terminations in this chapter, that's what we're focused on. So some adverse action. And then the last two are an either or situation. So you need either this one or this one. The employer sought replacement or hired one with contrasting protected class characteristics. For example, going back to the example of the African-American woman over 40, well, let's say she was replaced by an African-American male over 40. 
Well, that significantly strengthens her gender case, but it weakens her age case and her um, uh, a race case. Let's say instead that she was replaced by a woman who was Asian and over 40. Well, now the gender case is weak, the age discrimination case is weak, but the race claim has become stronger. So uh, especially when you're advancing multiple theories, um, what, whatever this the, the replacement person ultimately is will be pretty significant in your evaluation of which one of the claims are stronger. So we can fit into this category, number four, or we could go for number five. A similarly situated person with different protected class characteristics engaged in similar conduct but was not terminated. So again, our, our client or the, the employee was an African-American woman over the age of 40. She had a history of tardies. Uh, she was dismissed, but a, a Caucasian a woman over 40 had similar attendance and she was retained. Well, again, that uh, diminishes the strength of the, a, of the uh, age claim and the gender claim, but strengthens the race claim because the woman who was retained was white, the woman who was dismissed was African American. So again, as, as you go through the facts, you'll see um, which claims get stronger and which claims get weaker with respect to that. You only have to prove either three or, excuse me, either four or five to be able to make the prima facie case. Now, once you make the prima facie case, if you're the plaintiff, it doesn't mean you win. Now the employer can come back with a non-discriminatory reason. Let's say the reason why we retained, or the employer retained the Caucasian woman over 40 was that uh, the reason for her tardies were FMLA related. Well, okay, that's a pretty strong argument. You're probably not gonna win if you're the plaintiff under those circumstances. Um, so the employer has the opportunity to present a non-discriminatory reason and then the plaintiff has the opportunity to show that stated reason is in fact really a pretext. It's not the true reason that this particular employment decision was made. One of the best ways to avoid discriminatory dismissals is to enforce policies in a consistent manner. Um, when I was at JCPenney, employer employee uh, the, the HR department would keep a log of how they've handled various situations and when they made an exception they would explain why this was an exception so that they would have that database of information um, employers who are careful and consistent in this area can find that type of log helpful it's helpful if the employer makes wise decisions it's lousy if the employer is all over the map and is inconsistent. I mean, probably better not to have a paper trail of all of the, the exceptions you've made to your policy. So if you're going to mainly be consistent and relatively rarely deviate, and when you deviate, it's because of a very, very defendable reason, then a log like that can be very helpful. It's especially helpful when you have a large facility and you may have like one clearinghouse, the HR department, um, that, that kind of views all the dismissals before uh, you know, they're finalized and, and provides input under those circumstances. And so uh, you rarely make exceptions. When you do, you wanna document it and you want to have that information available uh, in a central place because people can forget. There can be turnover and the people who made a certain decision are no longer available to explain why they made the decision that they did. Well, um, at this point, I'm going to end this lecture. We will continue in a second lecture and finish up the material in this module. Um, as always, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu, or better yet, come by. I'd love to talk with you in more detail about these issues. Um, I look forward to uh, thank you for your attention today. I look forward to um, presenting to you the second half in a subsequent lecture. Thanks again for your attention. Have a wonderful day.